so the topic of the, the talk is partiality, uh, by which I just mean something like giving special treatment to, to uh, some people. I'll talk a bit more about that quite a lot, in fact, as we go along. Um, let me just start with some general observations. So I take it that most people agree that we're permitted, maybe in some cases required, to give special treatment to people that we stand in certain special relationships with. We can care more about our friends, our romantic partners, our families. And plausibly, I think we can give greater weight to the interests of those with whom we stand in certain sorts of collective projects, such as our co-nationals or compatriots. But surely most of us also agree that the presence of justified partiality doesn't eliminate our more general moral reasons or moral obligations to others. In some cases, however, these two sets of reasons have to be compared. We need to know how these two sets of reasons weigh against each other. But how much extra weight can partiality justify? Philosophers have had quite a bit to say about whether or not our reasons of partiality can override certain of our positive duties uh, of beneficence to others. For example, our duties to provide aid to the global poor. But while there's disagreement about the grounds and the extent of such partiality, most philosophers believe that we may indeed give some preference to our co-nationals with respect to those kinds of duties. By contrast, very little has been said concerning the question of how to weigh our various duties of partiality against our negative duties of non-maleficence to outsiders, in particular our duties to avoid harming or killing them. And while the uh, issue of beneficence arises most commonly in discussions of global justice, for example, the question of our duties of non-maleficence is especially pressing in the context of war, which generally involves risking, harming, and killing uh, many innocent people, some of whom are our co-nationals or compatriots, uh, many of whom are not. And while, as I said, many philosophers accept that our duties to our co-nationals may in some cases outweigh our duties of beneficence to outsiders, uh, very few philosophers, it seems to me, accept that we may prefer our co-nationals when it comes to our duties of non-maleficence to outsiders. My broad goal in this talk is to show that partiality can, in fact, uh, sometimes justify overriding certain otherwise weighty negative duties to those with whom we share no special relationship in order to satisfy duties, both positive and negative, uh, that we have towards those with whom we do share such a special relationship. Now, obviously, this is a view that many of you initially, probably right now, are thinking this is deeply counterintuitive. Um, but my hope is to show that it follows from naturally from some views that receive pretty widespread endorsement, uh, at least among philosophers writing on the ethics of war. So in order to get there, I plan to argue first that partiality's application is what I'll call unrestricted. It'll become clear in a minute. Um, and this is a view, as you'll see, that many philosophers have sought to reject. Um, it's quite popular to reject that view. Um, and it's probably contrary to most people's default assumption, I think. I'm also going to argue that the extra weight that partiality affords is best understood as a type of what I'll call a variable multiplier. That's not going to be clear now, but it'll be clear hopefully by the end of the talk. So those are the kind of two main claims I'll be making and defending. OK. so. Some of you might have caught the reference in the title of the talk. Um, back in 2012, philosopher Shelley Kagan wrote a book called The Geometry of Dessert, in which he used graphs to show kind of our best understanding of the concept of dessert. Dessert not meaning, of course, cake, but uh, things of what people are deserving of. Um, so he used graphs to illustrate that idea. I'm doing something similar here. Uh, whereas he used sort of line graphs, uh, I'll be using stacked bar graphs to show the relative weights of our reasons and how partiality uh, adds on top of base weights and this sort of stuff. And so I've got, I've got some graphs that we'll be looking at throughout the talk. Um, the various sets of duties, just in advance, the various sets of duties uh, are going to be distributed along the x-axis, and the combined weights of the duties will be distributed or, or uh, be sort of along the y-axis. And the taller the bar, the more reason we have to fulfill that particular duty as against the competing duties. Okay. So just some sort of background, background assumptions on, on sort of coming to this project. So I approach the topic of partiality, as most people do these days, I think, uh, within, from within a deontological framework. Um, and this means, of course, that I don't think partiality is only justified because it gives rise to the best outcome or it does, sort of does the best at maximizing uh, the outcome with respect to other uh, sorts of goods that we might take to be relevant. Um, uh, sort of this basic kind of consequentialist picture that some people might have uh, with respect to partiality. And for what it's worth, um, most of the philosophers that I'm looking at here, or the most of the philosophers I'm in conversation with in this talk, also uh, subscribe to a broadly deontological picture. So I don't think I'm assuming away the problems or anything like that. 
Another aspect of endorsing a broad deontological picture is that I endorse two important distinctions that I'm going to use very liberally in what follows. But let me say a little bit about them here. So first, I endorse what philosophers call the doctrine of doing and allowing, um, but what's the way it will be put going forward and what's most relevant for our purposes here is um, the uh, distinction between killing and letting die. The idea in short, in very, very short, is that uh, killing is generally worse than letting die, all else being equal. There are, of course, many objections to this view. It has a huge literature. People have written books on it. You might remember some cases involving babies in bathtubs and this kind of challenging that idea. I'm going to set aside those questions now and just assume, uh, I hope not too prejudicially, that that's a, a distinction worth preserving. And at any rate, that's, again, most of my interlocutors here endorse that as well. Um, I'm also going to refer to duties to aid or rescue as positive duties. And failing to fulfill them involves letting one die in the types of cases we'll be looking at. And by contrast, we have negative duties uh, to avoid killing people, avoid harming people. Uh, and there are two important types of killing that's worth distinguishing between for the purposes of uh, the talk today. The first is what's called opportunistic killing. In cases of opportunistic killing, the killer derives a benefit from the victim's death that he would not have achieved in her absence. Cases of opportunistic killing generally involve the aggressor treating the victim and typically her body as a means to his, i.e. the aggressor's, ends using someone as a means to your ends, uh, kind of the standard way of putting that. And this is what makes opportunistic killing more objectionable than eliminative or side effect killing. We're not going to talk about eliminative killing. Um, but in side effect killings, the killer derives no benefit from the death of his victim that he could not have achieved in her absence, with some kind of tricky cases on the, on the margins. But that's, that's the basic idea. Side effect killings then are, uh, are cases of killing in which the victim's being killed is effectively a byproduct of our action in, this, in many of the cases we're looking at here, a byproduct of our fulfilling some other duty, some more weighty duty. So in brief, the general ordering uh, in what follows goes something like this. Opportunistic killing is the hardest to justify, then side effect killing, and then failing to rescue, uh, i.e. letting die. Now there are complications with all this, um, but in order to get kind of going on the other interesting stuff, we kind of have to have that general picture in place. So if you're not a super huge subscriber to that picture, I invite you to just endorse it for the next 40 minutes or so and see what, see what comes from it, and then we can talk later about whether or not those are the right inputs, if you will. OK. So I want to begin um, with these distinctions in mind. I want to begin with uh, sort of a basic kind of pretty vague thesis that just can kind of give us a sense of what I mean by partiality in this context and what it can do. So this is what I'm calling the extra weight thesis, which says that the existence of a relationship of partiality generates extra weight in favor of fulfilling one's duties to the person with whom one stands in a special relationship. If the weight of one's impartial duties is x, uh, then the weight of one's duties from partiality is either x plus n or x multiplied by n. We'll see later that I've got something to say about each of those. Um, where that n is, as the, this suggests, either some set amount or a multiplier function. So in this view, the impartial base weight of a duty to, say, your spouse and a duty to a stranger, um, the, the base weight of those duties is equally the same, assuming they, you know, assuming the, all the relevant factors are the same. The base weight is the same. Um, then the extra value from partiality is figured in by this, uh, I, this n here. But for now, let's just assume that n is some positive value. I'll have more to say later towards the end of the talk about what exactly uh, that value is. Uh, but for now, let's just assume it's some extra amount. Right? The extra weight thesis just says it's more. Right? So we're going to have to refine this quite a bit as we go, but this is just a good starting point. OK, so but before we can determine the value of n, we should first consider whether n applies in all possible scenarios, or if it is silenced in some cases and active in others. So I'm going to look at three, restric three restricted views, which I think are the most plausible. Uh, there are plenty of other views, I'm sure, but these are what I take to be the most plausible. Um, spoiler alert, I think they're all mistaken, and I'm going to side with the view that says it's unrestricted. Okay. So I'm going to give you three restricted views and tell you why they're all wrong. So first, let's look at a view that I call the impartial duty relativity thesis. Uh, heads up, these are the most unwieldy names ever. I'm very open to suggestions if you have better ideas for the names. Um, all right. So according to this view, whether or not the extra weight from partiality applies to the duties we have to those with whom we stand in a special relationship. I'm going to use the word relative sometimes. And I don't necessarily mean blood relative. I mean the person with in this relationship. Um, the, whether or not it applies to the duties we have to a relative depends on the type of duty we have towards the stranger uh, that we would thereby infringe by acting on the duty 
uh, to the relative. And when the duty to the stranger involves certain significant duties, particularly significant duties, partiality is silenced. That's what this view says. So there are several possible versions of the view, but let's look at one that has, has had a fair bit of support in the literature on global justice. So concerning the negative duty to refrain from infringing basic rights by killing or injuring innocent people, uh, Foster David Miller writes, I'm inclined to think that this duty excludes any form of partiality toward compatriots. Uh, I'm also doubtful that one would be justified in infringing a stranger's rights in order to avoid infringing a compatriot's. I don't think it would be justifiable to switch the trolley from a track on which it was hurtling towards a compatriot onto a track on which it would hurtle towards a foreigner. Nor do I think if one takes the view that when the difference between the numbers on the two tracks becomes large enough, one ought to switch the trolley, that there should be any additional weight, weighting in favor of compatriots. Um, Thomas Pogge makes a similar point. He says, it's morally more important to stop injustices and other wrongs committed against our compatriots than to stop such injustices and wrongs committed against foreigners by third parties. And more generally, it's morally more important to attend to the needs of our compatriots than to give like assistance to foreigners. You can see the sort of positive duty part there. In the other case, however, when the undue harms foreigners suffer are our doing, foreigners and compatriots are on a par. So I think these are, I mean, there's, there's certain other ways you could read these, but I think the general idea here is that they're in, embracing this idea of the uh, impartial duty relativity thesis. Okay, so we can get clearer on what this view holds by looking at a couple of graphs. So we've got figure one and figure two here. In figure one, the extra weight from partiality. So sorry, we've got um, positive duty to save my son, positive duty to save a stranger. This is the base weight, which is low. You'll see later, I don't have numbers here, but you can kind of look at it in aggregate and you'll, see, you'll get a clear sense. We'll see, look at a few more, what this looks like. Um, again, and this is just for now, just a toy extra amount. Later, we're going to figure out what that amount actually is, but for now, it's just an extra amount. So in this, in, on figure one, the thesis says, look, since it's a positive duty to a stranger, we actually can apply extra weight from partiality to the duty to, in this case, my son. But in the other type of case, given that it's a negative duty, a particularly stringent type of duty, um, the extra weight from partiality doesn't apply. So that's what this thesis is suggesting, that when the, when the duty as, that we're acting sort of against, um, or the duty that we would infringe by acting uh, to um, fulfill the, the duty to the relative, that duty um, makes it such that the duty to our relative does not receive extra weight from partiality. Okay. So this view, as I've said, enjoys quite a bit of support in the literature. <coughs> it has a number of problems that seem to me to um, uh, count forcefully against it. So I'm going to be using a lot of trolley cases. They've earned a bad rap recently, but they're very, very important in the ethics of war. So uh, there's a lot of sort of good, good material there. So that's where I'm going here. Here's just one, uh, one type, the one type of case that we can look at for this. Okay, so you see a trolley heading in the direction of five innocent people who've been tied to the tracks by a madman. You can pull a lever, which will switch the track onto one of two side tracks. Um, your sister is on side track A. A stranger is on side track B. The only way to save the five strangers is to uh, divert the trolley onto either A or B. Now, I'm assuming here that you're required to turn the trolley one way or the other um, to save the five if it means one is killed as a side effect. You might disagree with that. It's pretty widely subscribed to in the literature, but it, for, the, for, our, for our purposes here, if you think the number is an eight, or you think it's higher or something, and you think it's lower, um, that's okay too for our purposes for, for this argument anyway. Um, so it's, it's mostly a structural point here, not so much a numbers point yet. So the example uh, that I've just made, uh, that I've just mentioned, prior to any extra weight from partiality is shown in figure three. So you've got the negative duty to your sister, the negative duty to the stranger, and the positive duties to five um, uh, other strangers. OK, so in this case, there are three different sets of duties that have to be compared. We have to make pairwise comparisons between them. So we've got one, the duty, uh, the negative uh, duty to avoid side effect killing of your sister. Second, there are positive duties in the five to the mainline track, uh, five that are tracked on, trapped on the mainline track. And third, there's the negative duty to avoid side effect killing the stranger. So we have to make these pairwise comparisons, one and two, uh, one and three, and two and three. So let's look at what those yield. So start with one and two. The impartial duty relativity thesis holds that positive duties to strangers do not silence extra weight from partiality. So your duty to your sister receives extra weight from partiality. You would go on thinking about the 
the graph, if it receives a boost, it can plausibly, depending on how much the boost is, a plausible amount of boost probably can overcome that. Um, so your duty to your sister receives extra weight and can plausibly outweigh the positive duties to rescue. Therefore, one outweighs two. However, according to the thesis, negative duties to strangers uh, do silence extra weight from partiality. Therefore, when we compare one and three, the two sets of negative duties, your duty to your sister doesn't receive any extra weight from partiality because the comparison is being made against uh, the very stringent negative duty. Therefore, one and three are equally weighty. You have no greater reason to do one over the other, according to this thesis. Finally, in our third comparison, uh, since five positive duties to rescue are weightier than one negative duty to avoid side effect killing, by hypothesis anyway, uh, two outweighs three. Okay. Now, assuming the principle of transitivity, we would expect that since one outweighs two, and one and three are equally weighty, that we would expect that three likewise outweighs two. But that's not true. We just saw that two outweighs three. Thus, this example fails to satisfy the principle of transitivity. If we were to try to determine what you ought to do in this scenario, we would find ourselves in a sort of inescapable loop. None of the options would outweigh both of the others. In other words, in cases of this sort, there's nothing, all things considered, that you're permitted to do. And this conclusion seems to me clearly mistaken. Now, for what it's worth, there's been some discussion lately in philosophy about uh, the principle of transitivity and whether or not it's sound, whether or not it applies in all cases. I think absent any special reason to think that it doesn't apply here, uh, we should think that it does and see that um, this generates a problem. So I think, um, since the conclusion seems to be mistaken, I think the better conclusion is is to think that it does apply here and this avoids transitivity, and figure four shows that this would look like. Are the graphs making sense? They make sense in my head. I just, okay. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, you can avoid them altogether if you just rather think about it the other way. But hopefully they're helpful. Here's another reason why the impartial duty relativity thesis is false. It prohibits partiality from even acting as a tiebreaker, which seems clearly wrong to me and probably to most of you. Here's an example that brings that out. There's a different sort of, tr sort of trolley case, um, but with four people strapped to the main track. And let's assume that, the saving, that saving four strangers is slightly less weighty than the negative duty to avoid side effects killing a stranger as a side effect. We can even assume, if you'd like, that they're equally weighty. If this is true, then we should not turn the trolley. We should either flip a coin, uh, or e either we should not turn the trolley or we should flip a coin, as the case may be, depending on which of those two you want to think about. And now suppose that one of the four on the mainline track is your mother or father. Intuitively, this changes things quite a bit. If the weights were so close before, either so close or exactly the same, surely this fact that one of them is your mother is enough to tip the scales. Um, surely the fact that the ones rescued as your family member is enough to make it permissible to turn the trolley onto the side track. But the impartial duty relativity thesis denies this. Um, the fact that the duty to the stranger is an important negative duty precludes any extra weight from partiality. Again, I think this conclusion is deeply counterintuitive. Uh, here's what that conclusion looks like. Uh, I think something like that, again, that's a toy amount, something like that is enough to overcome it. The view says, uh, even with one parent, this is what it would look like. And I think that that's deeply implausible. So in short, though, I'm giving you two reasons to think that we should reject the impartial duty relativity thesis. Um, now let's consider an alternative view, which I'll call the partial duty relativity thesis. According to this view, whether or not the extra weight from partiality applies to duties we have to those uh, with whom we stand in special relationships just depends on the type of duty it is to that person. And when the duty to this person involves significant duties, partiality is silenced. Okay, so it's sort of an inverse of the previous case. It says when we have particularly stringent duties to the people that are our relatives, then partiality is silenced. Um, for what it's worth, I don't know anyone that endorses this view. It seems to me at least plausible that you would think that if it applies in one kind of case, it applies in a different kind of case. Um, but as we'll see, it's very easy to dismiss this case. Um, for one thing, let me say something in favor of it, which is that it does avoid the problem of transitivity, right? Because the, the duty applies only to, sorry, the extra weight applies only to the duty, and so it's either there or it's not, and you don't have worries about transitivity that beset the previous uh, thesis. But this improvement comes at a significant cost. In particular, we tend to view partiality as not only generating greater reasons to aid those with whom we stand in certain special relationships, but also greater reasons to avoid harming them. To put it a bit colloquially, uh, a bit probably too casually, in fact, 
Uh, uh, while anyone can ask of a given harm, how could you do that? Uh, a central feature of special relationships is that it allows us to say, how could you do that to me? Right. So there's certainly something more important in, part in relationships of partiality that suggests that the greater the duty, there's something more important about it, and it's not obvious why we should want to cancel or silence partiality in those cases. It therefore seems contrary to our common sense understanding of our special duties to suggest that they're rendered inapplicable once the type of harm in question is significant enough. In fact, pretty much the reverse seems to be true, as I've kind of suggested. It's precisely because significant harms are so significant that we have greater reason not to bring them upon our relatives. Okay? So I think the partial duty relativity thesis is also false, in this case, on our best understanding of what partiality actually entails. So there's a further view that some might be inclined towards, um, which is sort of just a hybrid view of the two that I've just sketched. Uh, call this the particular combination thesis. Again, an inelegant name. I'm open to suggestions. Um, it holds that whether or not the extra weight from partiality applies to the duties we have to our relatives uh, depends on the particular combination of duties in question. So, for example, uh, when, a partial, when the partial duty, that is the duty to our relative, uh, is a positive duty to rescue or something weaker, and the impartial duty to a stranger is a negative duty uh, of a very significant sort, for example, a duty to avoid opportunistic killing, uh, partiality is silenced, but only with that particular combination of duties. In other words, when the two duties compared a relatively weak duty to a relative and a very strong duty to the stranger, partiality doesn't apply. So here's an example to which someone who defends this view might appeal to make their case. Um, so a runaway trolley is hurtling down the track, as has been happening a lot lately. Uh, you're on a bridge that overlooks the trolley. Next to you is a bodybuilder, a very, very big guy, who if you were to push him down into the tracks in front of the speeding trolley, he would die while stopping the trolley from killing your brother. This is a familiar case if you're familiar with the basic literature on trolley problems. So most people probably agree that you're not permitted to throw the bodybuilder onto the tracks to save your brother. The negative duty to avoid opportunistic killing is just too important. Using someone as a means for those purposes is just very, very hard to justify, and the fact that he's your brother isn't enough to justify it. Um, this is modeled in figure eight. You'll notice I've skipped figure seven. I've omitted that it's in the paper, but not in the talk. So. Um, in figure eight, you do something like this. Uh, the particular combination thesis says, look, the duty, negative duty is so, so big. The positive duty to rescue um, is quite small by comparison. Um, and so it just, you know, given the importance of the duties, it just silences the extra weight from partiality. However, it's important to note that even if we might agree with the verdict in this case, that, that is the verdict that you can't um, push the bodybuilder onto the tracks, it's important, or sorry, it's not proof that the par particular combination thesis is right. It could just be that the extra weight from partiality, though applicable, is not enough to overcome the base weight of the opportunistic, uh, the duty to avoid opportunistic killing of the stranger. And figure nine shows this case, and it's just a nice kind of. So even if the extra amount is quite significant, the toy amount I've been playing with, um, and we'll, even the one I'll later defend, as I'll, as I'll say when I get there, um, it's just not enough to overcome the base weight, right? So that's one thought we might have. So in order to demonstrate the truth of the particular combination thesis, we need a case that can't be explained as an instance of what I've just shown, an instance of the base weight of opportunistic killing just being so large that it trumps even the combined weight of the base weight to our relative and the extra weight from partiality. And here's a case that, uh, that might help us to see uh, that, that that's the, the suggestion I've made is more plausible. So this is a, a same version of the trolley uh, bridge case we just looked at. So a runaway trolley is hurling down the track. Uh, next to you is a bodybuilder. You can push him at the track to stop from the speeding trolley. Um, uh, sorry, there are X people on the tracks this time. We're going to fill in that number in a second. Uh, I invite you to stipulate a number of X such that it's just not shy of the tipping point for justified opportunistic killing. So you've got that bar, you remember, and now we're just going to aggregate as many positive duties until it comes just shy of the tipping point. Okay? It's, I'm going to say 15 people. Suppose that when it's 15 people, you've got opportunistic duties right here, and 15 people in aggregate is right here. If you don't like that number, come up with a different number. It's a structural point, not a numbers point. So as it stands, you aren't justified in pushing the bodybuilder. It takes more in order to justify pushing the bodybuilder. 15 is just shy of that. Now assume one of the 15 people strapped to the tracks is your brother. 
are you now permitted to push the bodybuilder? In other words, does that generate any extra weight? I think that you are justified in pushing the bodybuilder in that case, but the particular combination thesis again says that you're not. Given that the duty to the bodybuilder is a duty to avoid opportunistic killing, and the duty to your brother is one of rescue, it receives no boost from partiality, presumably even in, when it takes the form of being part of an aggregated sum. But surely the fact that he's your brother can make some difference, surely enough to tip the scales. But again, the particular combination thesis denies this. And so for that reason, I think we should reject this view as well. So just to recap what we've got so far, I've said that the impartial duty relativity thesis is false, the partial duty relativity thesis is false, and the particular combination thesis is false. To be sure, there are other combinations we could try. There are various other restrictions we can place. I worry that they might be more or less ad hoc. But I think the more natural view is to conclude that partiality's application uh, is unrestricted. This just means, it sounds broader than maybe uh, I intended, but uh, this just means that the extra weight from partiality always applies no matter the types of duties. Um, though, of course, as we've just seen, in many cases it might be outweighed by the base weight of those other duties. Of course, now the question is, how do we know when it's outweighed? In other words, we need to attend to the issue of how much extra weight partiality affords. The first part of knowing how much extra weight there is, is knowing how the extra weight factors in. Once again, I'm going to look at three views, but unlike the previous section, I think a third view is right. So, spoiler alert again, sorry. Uh, so let's start by recalling the extra weight thesis I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Recall that this view held that the weight of one's duties from partiality is x plus n or x multiplied by n, where n is either fixed weight or a multiplier function. So the first view uh, that I want to look at is one I call the fixed added weight thesis. This view holds that n, that extra value, is just an unrestricted free uh, fixed weight that is a specific amount of added weight that applies equally to all acts of partiality. Mm. And you might think initially, because I've said it's unrestricted, that something like that looks quite plausible. Um, now for now, we're going to have to leave unanswered precisely how much extra weight is added. Um, but again, we're going to look at some structural issues with this. Um, so let's look at a case that we'll call fire. Ten innocent people are trapped inside a burning building. You can either go into the first room and save one person, or the second room and save nine people, but you can't do both. You don't have time and the, the smoke is billowing. You can save the one or the nine. Um, oh, by the way, the one is your child. I think most people would judge that you're permitted to save your child instead of saving the nine innocent people. Of course, holding everything else. You didn't start the fire or all that. Um, if so, then it seems that as though the fixed amount, according to the fixed added weight thesis, is something like the same weight as a little bit more than eight positive duties to rescue. Perhaps a lot more, but the lower threshold is that it's 8.1 or something. These two cases are illustrated in figure 10 and 11. So you have the 1 and the 9. 1, if you can do more, then it can go, I mean, I've drawn it a little bit higher there, but you can go, uh, you can do more than saving them. That, you have more reason to do that than that. Now, for what it's worth, as I've said, the precise number won't matter much for what I'm about to argue. So if you're thinking, no, it can't be that high, it's closer to 5 or 6, fine. Just make the relevant adjustments, and you'll see that it, that, that point right now doesn't matter too much. It will matter later, though, but we'll have to talk about it then. So the important thing for this view is that there are certain examples that show, I think, quite decisively that it cannot possibly be right. And here's one such case. You can either help your child with her homework, or you can rescue some number x of other children from a burning building. Assume that neither your child nor the other ch children will receive aid otherwise. Now, just as a poll, how many of you think that you're permitted to help your child with her homework <laughs> in this case? Yeah, really? <laughs> I think uh, my sense is that pretty much no one thinks that that's Maybe you would do it, but I don't think anyone thinks that it would be justified. Put it this way, it's a minority view. Um, my sense is that nearly everyone's going to agree that you're obligated to save the children over helping your child with her homework. But the fixed added weight thesis doesn't guarantee this conclusion. In fact, it suggests that it can't really very easily be obtained. obtained. Um, so recall that our previous example suggested that the value of n, that extra amount, is a little over eight positive duties to rescue. If this is the right value of n, then this added to the extremely low base weight of the positive duty to help your child with their homework, yields the conclusion that you're permitted to help your child over saving around eight strangers. 
This is wildly implausible. Uh, this case is shown in figure 12 and 13. Uh, that's actually shown in figure 13. This is clearly not drawn to scale, but um, at any rate. Uh, notice that it's equally implausible as we see in figure 12. Um, for whatever other value you might want to plug in for x in that example, it strikes me as implausible even if it's only one stranger who could be saved. In other words, if you wanted to reduce this extra amount, amount you would have to reduce it quite low, and then it's not going to generate any of your permissions in any of your other cases. So whatever plausible sort of amount you give, like in the fire case, for example, uh, applied here, it's going to generate these wild, wildly implausible conclusions. So this strikes me as pretty decisive against the fixed added weight thesis. So I'm going to suggest in a little bit. We're, we're going to return to uh, at least some of the intuitions that are behind this view uh, at the end. More on that in a bit. So I now want to move on to another fixed view namely what I'll call the fixed multiplier thesis. So this view says that the extra weight n is an unrestricted fixed multiplier. In other words, this means that the extra weight from partiality is a multiplier function, say two or three times just multiplied uh, to the, the base weight of the duty in question. Okay. We can understand our earlier case uh, fire in this way. On that view, um, you'll recall it's, we can understand it as um, not being that we add eight positive duties, but that we multiply the base weight of the initial positive duty by nine to get the verdict that it can overtake competing positive duties to strangers. And this, this view, this, uh, uh, this fixed multiplier view, uh, gets the right verdict in the homework case as well. Given that the base weight of the positive duty is extremely low, uh, even multiplying it by 10, again, this is not to scale, um, will fail to overcome even one positive duty to rescue a stranger from a burning building. Uh, and this is drawn in figure 14. Again, not to scale exactly. It's not as if you had a couple of kids you could then, anyway. Point is, this, this is supposed to be quite small, but I need to make it large enough so you can see it. So, so it seems then that the fixed multiplier thesis is an improvement over the fixed added weight thesis. So I think we're done then, except for there's this big problem, um, which is that, uh, again, comes out from the trolley case. Okay, so you see a trolley heading in the direction of five innocent people. You can pull the lever so it goes on the sidetrack. The person on the sidetrack is your wife. Many will agree that you're permitted to let the trolley kill the five instead of turning it. We've already kind of seen these intuitions pumped. But notice that the fixed multiplier thesis is much more permissive than that, and much more permissive than most of us would likely think. In particular, if the judgments of the fire case are to, are to be believed are correct, then we multiply the base duty, in this case, by nine, to get the extra weight from partiality. But in this case, that means you could per prefer to save your wife instead of 50 strangers. And I think even staunch defenders of partiality, with the exception of, again, some minority few, are going to think that that's far too permissive. I think the intuition is that that's far too permissive. So for that reason, I think we ought to reject the fixed multiplier thesis. Uh, and instead, I think we ought to embrace a variable multiplier thesis. Now, a variable multiplier thesis holds that the value of the added weight from partiality is a function of the base weight of the duty and the relevant multiplier for that type of duty. So the fixed multiplier thesis said it's the same multiplier for everything. This view says depends on the duty. Some duties have different, or every duty has a different multiplier uh, depending on the type of duty that it is. I'm not going to defend this view here, but I am going to suggest that um, uh, the basic idea is that the size of the multiplier will be inversely related to the size of the duty. In other words, the smaller the base weight, the larger the multiplier. So we can uh, prefer helping your child with her homework over a lot of strangers' kids, hundreds perhaps, um, but you can only avoid side effect killing your wife when the number of the strangers on, on the mainline track is relatively small, certainly less than 50. So this view overcomes all the major problems that beset the other views. We won't have wildly implausible verdicts in these homework or trolley style cases, the types of problems that beset the previous two views. And so I think we ought to accept this variable multiplier thesis. The problem, of course, this isn't a problem for the view. I do, I endorse the view. But the next question to ask is, uh, what are the multipliers? So let me suggest one possible view. This is a very complicated view, and uh, the name is even more unwieldy than the view for him. Um, I call it the fixed weight variable multiplier thesis. Um, again, please let me know if you can think of a catchier name. Um, so this view holds that the extra weight from partiality is a variable multiplier, and the size of the multiplier in terms of the extra weight that it provides is roughly equivalent to the absolute added weight from partiality to other duties 
with relatively similar outcomes understood in kind of consequentialist terms prior to any sort of aggregation. That's very dense. Let me spell that out a little bit. So first, it's a multiplier view at heart. The extra amount from partiality uh, for a given duty is a multiplier function according to that duty's uh, base weight. But I'm also bringing in something here that's appealing from the discussion about the fixed added weight pieces, namely that it affords the same amount of extra weight from partiality across all duties, um, the same amount in terms of in absolute terms. Of course, there were significant problems with that view, as we saw, but part of it can be salvaged, in particular when we take all the duties whose violation involves a similar outcome. So just to put that in more concrete terms, take all, the, with the exception of the homework case, all the cases that we've looked at involve death, the killing in, or killing or letting die of innocent people, that's a sort of category in a non-consequentialist, or in a, in a sort of consequentialist way, uh, vaguely consequentialist way, that's the category. And so we say um, all, all of the duties whose violation involves a similar outcome, in this case deaths, um, and we apply a fixed amount of partiality to each of those duties. And then from that we can see what the multiplier is. Now of course we're going to have to do this for all types of cases. So for example, all duties that have outcomes similar to the positive duty to help your child with her homework, those types of duties are also going to share a fixed weight. So to put this point a different way, if this helps, uh, the view is locally constant. The added weight it affords is the same across all duties with infringements with similar outcomes. Right? So all the death cases are going to have the same absolute value fixed weight. All the homework cases are going to have the same, for them, uh, added weight. But those two added weights will be different. So it's locally constant, local to a set of outcomes, but it's globally non-constant. Just to say that the absolute value is the same when the outcome is death, but the absolute value is different when the outcome is, say, a small amount of pain, homework cases, whatever. Okay, it's very tricky. I think it becomes clearer when we look at some cases. Um, so in order to do this, we need to look at some particular cases. And in the course of doing this, I'm going to endorse some judgments that you might find more or less plausible. Um, I invite you to come along for the ride, and then we can see later whether or not amending uh, the view to accommodate the intuitions you have will be possible. I think generally, since these kind of build upon themselves, you can make certain amendments early and get a series of judgments that you might find plausible throughout. Mm -hmm. It's a structure that you can sort of fill in with di different inputs and get a lot of the same, uh, or a consistent package of about okay, so to begin, recall the case from earlier, fire, ten, ten innocent people, one in one room, nine in the other, the one is your child. As we saw there, it seems you're permitted to save your child instead of saving nine strangers. Um, I assume intuitions about this case are broadly shared, though of course the specific number of strangers we could forego saving is perhaps less precise than I'm suggesting, and it may be slightly more or slightly less. Let's operate on the assumption just for now that the number is nine. If you want to roll your eyes, I won't be offended if, if you don't like the precision of the numbers. It's a structural point that we have to fill in with some numbers. So, but I get that it seems a little over precise. Um, so if so, then it seems that the multiplier for positive duties to rescue is about nine times the base weight. In fact, it's slightly higher than that because we need to uh, be able to overcome it. But for simplicity, we'll just say it's around nine. And notice that this is nine times the base weight of a positive duty to rescue. It's not nine times any positive duty. It's nine times that particular type of duty. And so this is what helps us avoid the unpalatable conclusions in the homework style cases. This judgment is shown in figure 15. This is a figure that's familiar to you, but now I've filled it in with a more, more or less precise amount. Um, now, according to the fixed weight variable multiplier thesis, the absolute value of partiality across all duties with a similar outcome, as I previously discussed, is slightly more than the base weight of eight positive duties to rescue. Okay. Let me put that in a different way that might be helpful because this is actually how I did it. You can copy paste this extra amount and just kind of hold it in your clipboard. And now when we set up different cases, you can just paste it. Right. So if that helps. But, but all the cases will involve these killing, letting, die cases. All of them will involve death as the uh, relevant outcome. Okay. Thus, if the view in question is right, then the added weight from partiality for other duties of this sort, that is duties to avoid side effect killing and opportunistic killing, it, uh, that, that absolute added amount is eight positive duties to rescue. We can see this by looking at another case, one with different kinds of duties at stake. Recall the basic trolley cases we've been considering. Here are two of them again, figure 16 and 17. These are trolley and trolley two for your reference. 
Now consider a version of the case from earlier, which I called trolley multiplier, in which there are five people strapped to the mainline track and one person strapped to the side track, but that one person is your spouse. Again, I suspect many will have the strong intuition that you're not required to turn the trolley towards your spouse in order to save the five. Indeed, many philosophers endorse this conclusion that's pretty widely accepted. The idea here is simply that the duty to avoid side effect killing of your spouse is so high, so important, uh, and the relative duties, even taken in aggregate, to rescue strangers are comparatively low. This is shown in figure 18. So that's the copy-pasted extra amount, if you like. Figure 19 shows that you're even permitted on this view to avoid turning the trolley toward your spouse up until the number of strangers on the mainline track reaches around 13. Again, excuse the precision. Again, set aside our worries about precision, just for the moment. The number is, I'm using a number here, but just think about the general uh, basic judgment. Does it seem right? And I think that if you're inclined to partiality, uh, it does seem right. Morality should allow me to give greater weight to my spouse, not infinitely greater weight, but a lot of, lot of extra weight, especially when the duty to her is so significant. So with this case in mind, we can now see the multiplier for negative duties to avoid side effect killing is about three times. This is because it's like one, two, three. Um, this is because the absolute weight of uh, the absolute weight is around eight positive duties to uh, rescue. That translates on our model to about three times the base weight. So again, we say that see that as the base weight of the duty goes up, the uh, value of the multiplier goes down. So with the positive duties, it was nine times. In this case, it's three times. We also get what I think are plausible outcomes when the scenario is reversed. That is, when we compare a positive duty to a relative and a negative duty to avoid side effect killing of a stranger. Figure 20 shows this case in a non-relative form, and figure 20 shows us what the view under consideration would say if partiality applies in the way that I've suggested. But now, notice that actually the added weight from partiality could overcome, or at least come close to tying, two negative duties to strangers here. Figure 22 shows what this looks like. Now, you might think that uh, you're reluctant to endorse that conclusion. You might think no one would endorse that conclusion. I happen to endorse that conclusion. Um, but some philosophers have as well. Um, so here's Tom Herkin in, in a very famous paper saying, uh, imagine that a victim is being attacked by an aggressor and that the only way a third party can save the victim's life is by throwing a grenade that will kill the attacker and also unavoidably an innocent bystander. Now imagine that the defender is also the victim's father. It seems to me that he may throw the grenade and may do so even if this will kill some number of bystanders greater than one. Now we ignore the attacker in these kinds of cases. We're assuming full liability. The duties to them don't count. It's not the same here. Um, and so the type of case is, is structured similar to this. So in this picture, we ignore the, oh, I just said, uh, Herka's idea here is structurally the same as this graph. Provided the killing in question is a side effect, as the case is suggested, then it's permissible uh, because of the added weight from partiality. Now you might be saying, wow, it looks like on your view partiality can justify pretty much anything. Of course, I said earlier that I thought the view was too permissive in some cases. Um, so that, that's not quite right. But uh, it would be bad if it had these wildly permissive um, implications. And I think it actually does a nice job, this particular view, of drawing an upper limit to what partiality can justify, depending on how you understand the various space waves. So here's an example. This is one from earlier, the trolley bridge partiality case. I'll remember that one, pushing the bodybuilder to save. Uh, in this case, your brother. Figure 23 shows what this looks like. This is uh, a version of the case we saw earlier, not with the toy amount anymore, now with the actual amount. As I've suggested already, the weight of opportunistic killing is significant, much more significant than any of the other duties we've considered. For that reason, it's the hardest to justify. And indeed, I think that in this case, the duty to avoid opportunistic killing is so significant that even with the added weight from partiality on top of the base weight, uh, the duty to oppor opportunistic killing to avoid opportunistic killing wins out. Now, I don't have spe uh, especially firm intuitions about the base weight of opportunistic killing. It doesn't show up in a lot of cases to which we can appeal to kind of general philosophical consensus. Uh, but I've rendered it as a precise amount here that I think is quite plausible. But surely, there's some number of people on the tracks that would justify pushing the bodybuilder at some point. And let's stick with the weight that I've drawn here, and uh, which would yield the verdict that the number of people would be 15 or so. So if 15 people could be saved, we can push the bodybuilder. This means as well that if the bodybuilder is your brother, uh, you can forego pushing him until around 23 or so are on the tracks. Right? 
After that, the aggregate weight of your duties to them outweighs that of your duty to your brother. Now, maybe this is too weak or too strong. I'm not entirely sure. Again, I'm not entirely sure about the base weight of opportunistic killing, comparatively anyway. Um, but we can adjust the base weight to reflect our best judgments here. What the general idea does show, I think, is that the multiplier for the negative duty to avoid opportunistic killing is less than two. Your handout says one, that's a typo. It's less than two. Without knowing more about the precise base weight, we can't get much more specific than this. Pr pretty considerably less than two, I think. Um, but again, this comports with our general tendency of seeing multipliers as getting smaller as the base weight increases. And it seems to comport with the sense that opportunistic killing is hard to justify. Let me just close with a few uh, kind of lingering issues that I'm uh, thinking about and uh, are going to be important for, for the sort of more full picture of this. So first I focus on what I call the paradigmatic relationships, spouses, parent-child relationships, families, and so on. I did mention some stuff about global justice. Um, it might be that the amount of partiality that a co-national or compatriot relationship affords is different from that of these other kinds of relationships. And if so, then we're going to need a set of multipliers not just for every duty, but for the type of uh, relationship in question. Uh, as it happens, I, I, I have arguments elsewhere where I would say that I think in, in a number of cases, those uh, the extra weight that it affords is roughly the same in many of these uh, kind of central cases and the paradigmatic cases. Uh, but I'm not going to argue for that here. I just think a fuller discussion of this would have to take that into account. I'm aware of that. Can't do that here. Another thing that I've left out is whether or not these multipliers can aggregate. So for example, if there are several of my brothers on the sidetrack, do they each get a multiplier of the same weight, or do they kind of diminish the greater their number? By 10, is it 10 times each of them uh, getting an extra uh, boost? Um, and if not, then we wouldn't want to know why and what the, what the function of that is. Um, so it's going to generate some difficult cases. I'm not entirely sure what to say about them. Uh, but it's going to be very important if we want to have something to say in these global justice or war cases where often the number of people in question that are, you know, we're either defending or harming are going to be lots of people of, of a relevant uh, group uh, of those with whom we stand in a relevant sort of relationship. So to know the full extent of how partiality implies in war, which is part of my larger project, we need to know whether or not these uh, extra, uh, these multipliers can aggregate. Finally, let me say again that I understand the precision of the discussion might seem fundamentally mistaken. Um, we can't possibly know with such precision, you might think, precisely how many people must be tied to the track in order to justify turning. But as I've tried to suggest throughout, I basically agree with that criticism. Uh, nevertheless, it's useful for us to imagine the sorts of cases that seem to us justified in order to see what sorts of permissions partiality can afford. And in any case, I think the, the broader point I've tried to make here today is that the structure of how we uh, is concerns the structure of how we should think about partiality. In my view, even if our, some of our inputs are quite vague, partiality requires calculation, uh, and we need to be clear on what the relevant functions are. Thanks.